This meeting is being recorded. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, dear brother uh, Imam Isa, you are, thank you for coming back and doing this uh, program with me again. Um, so, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uqadatam min lisani yabkahu qawli amma muslimi ala Muhammad. So we're going to today talk about, I guess, the attempt to, as you put it to me earlier when we were talking today, the attempts of what we can maybe for today call um, reform movements or pseudo-reform movements within Islam uh, to break down traditional Islam. And so I know that is a topic that me and you have talked about and is a concern as members of the Ummah, is a concern for us of what's happening in the world. So, uh, Bismillah, I'll hand it over to you, inshallah. Okay. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa wa ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Is my audio clear? Everything sound good? Alhamdulillah, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone. Uh, Allahumma arina al haqqa haqqan wa razuqan al tiba'a wa arina al batila batila wa razuqan al jtinaba. Allahumma arina al ashia'a kamahi. Oh Allah, we la- I hope uh, that you will um, answer this dua by letting us see truth as truth and, and, and following it and let us see falsehood as falsehood and keeping it away from us. And uh, that you allow us to see things as they really are and not just how they appear to our senses. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking. Uh, our teacher, our common teacher, uh, Sheikh Imran Nasser Hussein, for uh, helping open my eyes to a lot of things uh, to see past the physical, penetrate beyond uh, the surface of things. Um, actually, uh, I had the opportunity to spend uh, some time with him, as well as uh, one of his great students, uh, Brother Jaleel, and uh, benefited greatly from them. Um, so, without further ado, um, for those of you who are familiar with some of the previous videos I've done with Sheikh Omar, um, some of my interests are comparative religion, uh, the occult, and um, of course I'm a student of Sheikh Imran Hussein uh, in the sense that I, you know, apply his methodology for understanding, uh, reciting the Quran firstly and then understanding it. Um, so I think it was probably late last year it's not the first time I encountered this, by the way, but late last year that I encountered a lot of the uh, sectarian reform movements uh, that are popping up all over YouTube um, that seek to kind of take a fresh look at uh, Islam, either from a, a modernist perspective or from a perspective, uh, basically, of criticism. And actually, this stems from something quite bigger that I think began a long time ago. OK, which is when modern Western civilization began to eat from the tree of the knowledge of evil. Um, so if you're familiar with the Bible, you should go back and read the book of Genesis when God creates Adam and Eve. Uh, it's slightly different than the story in the Quran, but it's still a very beneficial read. But in it, you're going to find that, you know, God places this tree in the garden and uh, there's two different trees mentioned. One of them is the tree of life, and one of them is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when modern Western civilization began, it began uh, from Western civilization and then moved on into modern Western civilization. So I wanna, I'm, I'm going to try and just refer to it by that name, uh, not just simply Western civilization. Uh, modern Western civilization is where, uh, thanks to our great teacher, we realized that the Antichrist, uh, Al-Masih al-Dajjal, began his mission, and specifically from the island of, of Britain. Uh, and according to our good friend, Brother Jalil, probably somewhere in Scotland. Um, so uh, the, this, uh, this was basically a reform movement. So... Me and you both have done a lot of work on on the origins of Gog and Magog. And, you know, Britain is very unique in the sense that they have the statues of Gog and Magog and they have this kind of folklore history of the island. Um, 
But there are people who appear to be religious on the outside, but inwardly they're only using religion uh, to, to obtain a means. Um, the first thing I'd like to mention is that if you want to understand this talk on a deeper level, I'm going to recommend a few things by sharing my screen firstly. So you should do a little bit of homework so you can understand some of the things that we're going to refer to. Uh, will you allow me to share my screen? Okay, so um, I highly recommend all of you go look up Dr. Ali Atai's uh, lectures on postmodernism, okay? Um, because it's going to help you understand uh, what I'm talking about. You should also uh, do a little bit of homework um, on this subject right here, which is the Phoenix, okay? Which is, this is something from the occult uh, that began in Greece, but the Phoenix is an immortal bird associated with Greek mythology that... Uh, is able to you know, regenerate itself or otherwise be born again. And it's associated with the sun, but uh, the phoenix uh, obtains new life by arising out of the ashes of something, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna be referring to the phoenix in postmodernism a lot. Okay, so where to start? These movements, uh, and you, you talked about uh, this earlier, uh, basically, um, if, you're familiar with some just of so that, the uh, just so that the listeners are clear when we mean these movements i just want i don't want to name specific movements um uh, but denial of tradition denial of um not respecting the past and the scholars of the past or just taking the entire islamic heritage and intellectual heritage and kind of like dismissing it with what you said, which is a very good, I guess, way of putting it, like looking at Islam from a fresh point of view, but completely disconnected from anything in the past. And that comes in many shapes and forms. Yes, um, actually, what you're saying is, is, is the essence of what I'm what I want to talk about today. So uh, most of these movements, um, they actually uh, are, are not interested in kind of like taking the body of, of orthodox Sunni Islam and like knocking the rust off of it, which is what I would say Sheikh Imran Hussein is doing. So he's trying to-, to take Or any Mujahid the, would do, you know. Right. But instead it's to crumble the building to its foundations. And even to, to you could say eventually crumble the foundation itself and then rebuild it back, okay? but on a totally new set of principles and ideas. And to take the words, and to, to redefine language so that it no longer functions as it's coherent. It, it's constantly in a state of flux. So these- Talk about these, Islamic eschatology via Quran. Right. Um, and, and the Quran points us to this, that there's going to be these people who distort the meanings of words. Uh, but it gets even deeper than that. So I want to bring a few interesting hadith. So we mentioned something from the Quran about this, and I'll, I'll bring you some interesting hadith on this subject. Uh, are you seeing my screen? Okay, so I'm going to read you the following hadith. So in, uh, are you hearing me fine, uh, Sheikh Omar? Yes, bismillah. So uh, there's a hadith uh, narrated from Jabir. Now, this hadith is considered to be fabricated, okay? But it's a prophecy. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat that I typically take hadith gratings on prophecies with a grain of salt because of the uh, trouble in determining why a person would fabricate something about the future um, other things, it's easy to understand why someone would fabricate something, but in this case, uh, it's hard to understand why they would even make something like this up. Secondly, I'm going to say that I don't believe that this hadith is fabricated because I'm going to quote another hadith that isn't fabricated that supports it. That, the hadith just, basically just on that point, Imam Isa, if I can say something that's a very, very important point. And the reason that it's an important point is because... It's not part of the A'mal, meaning praying in Medina five times a day, praying in the masjid. That's something they were doing generation to generation. It was absolutely well established, right? Prophecies falls into one of those issues that's like literally like khabar. It's like 
it just got heard and then got transmitted to the next person. And it's not like something the whole community was involved in, like giving zakat or janazah prayers or umrah or hajj. And also, when it came to prophecies, there was a greater chance of misunderstanding what the Prophet was saying, sallallahu alayhi wa Because he's not talking about that time, he's talking about something in the future. So I've seen many, uh, this is not the time to get into this, where it seems like the Rawi, the narrator, got confused between, let's say, two different events and merged them together, for just as an instance of an example. So... Islamic eschatology in terms of hadith also there's another aspect and then uh, which is that the scholars of Islam were primarily in the beginning interested in the sharia and to verify sharia aspects of Islam and so their concern was how authentic is this hadith about doing wudu this is why many of the hadith that are that have great wisdom in it right uh, for example, uh, just as an example, I wanted to be known and then I created man. There's a weak hadith, but there's a great wisdom in it. There are other ahadiths like that, but they're known to be weak because they, they weren't so much interested in the beginning of collecting, uh, of collecting, they were less interested is probably the better word. They were less interested in things that didn't have to do with practicality uh, in, in terms of hadith collectors. Uh, they were interested in the Maghazi historical events of the Prophet, وسلم, the beauty of the Prophet, how he did things, that was there. Uh, but certain things like uh, eschatology, Islamic eschatology, even though they all had Kitab al-Fitan, Kitab al-Mahdi, Kitab al-Fitan, they all had this. But in terms of 1,400 years of scholarship, there was less importance. Even when you study hadith, I don't know if you know this, in the madrasa system, you spend so much time studying tahara, salah, dikab, kitab al-bayu, you know, all this, that you never even get to kitab al-fitan most of the time in the madaris. You never get to even that because it's so far in that seven years pass by the time, and they have to finish all the books. So they, if they can't finish all the books completely, they finish all the books, um, certain portions. And this has become part of how the Madaris work today. <clears throat> anyway, so I was just putting that out there in terms of there may be weak hadith in Islamic eschatology that are true because it doesn't meet a certain criteria. And then there may be weak hadith in Islamic eschatology or a, even, a, even a higher grade, but may not be true because of how, because of uh, what they were interested back then and also because it wasn't a communal practice. It wasn't a day-to-day -day thing that everyone was interested in. So only certain companions were really Interested, like Abu Harir radiallahu anh, was interested. Hudayfa bin Yaman was very interested about the events of the future. Anyway, I was just throwing that out there. You can also comment on what I said and then continue, inshallah. So, so I'll just tell you, this is how I look at things. If I read a hadith and I can see it happening in front of me and it's a prophecy in the future, I don't care what the hadith great narrator said it was. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's that's basically what I'm working on with, with the, these right here. So so the Prophet Islam basically said that when the last people of this ummah curse the first, at that time, whoever conceals a hadith will be concealing what Allah has revealed. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you why I don't believe this hadith is fabricated because there's another hadith that isn't that basically confirms it. So Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. He said that the Prophet Sallallahu said, if my ummah bears 15 traits, tribulations or fitan will befall it. Someone asked, what are they, O Messenger of Allah? He said, when any gain is shared out only among the rich, with no benefit to the poor, when a trust or a manna becomes a means of making a profit, when people uh, paying zakat, it becomes a burden to them. When a man disobeys his wife and, and uh, or obeys his wife and disobeys his mother, when he treats his friend kindly and shuns his father, when voices are raised in the mosques, when the leaders of the people are the worst of them, 
And when a man treats with respect, a man is treated with respect because he fears, uh, people fear the evil that he'll do. And when wine is drunk, and when men wear silk, and where female singers and musical instruments become popular. And then finally, this one, when the last ones of this ummah curse the first, then expect a red wind and the earth to swallow them and them to be transformed into animals. Okay, so these, this particular hadith is fine and it strengthens the other one. But the reason I'm saying this is because that's effectively what all of these Islamic movements are doing. Okay, I'm going to tell you very bluntly what's happening. They're not attacking aspects of Islam or even interpretations of certain ayahs or hadith. They're literally saying, and I've heard them say, whether it's the reform movements that began in Nejd or the reform, reform movements that are primarily happening in Western civilization in the English language on, on YouTube and the internet, is that praying towards the Kaaba is shirk, okay? That asking Allah by names that he has in the Quran is shirk. That, you know, uh, going up and kissing the black stone is shirk. That praying five times a day is an innovation in Islam. I mean, they're literally going after the very foundations of orthodox Sunni Islam hmm. and trying to say that these things are wrong and that the entirety of the Muslim ummah who've believed in these things and done these things for at least 1,400 years are all misguided. <coughs> and, and, and that the only possible way we can deal with this problem is that we have to just destroy the whole building and then build it back from scratch. And what I find interesting about all of them is they're very egocentric movements. They put you in the place of the prophet, Islam. meaning that uh, Allah sets up very early on in the Quran this concept of the Khalifa. Now, I'm going to try and uh, explain this the best way I can because it may be a little bit hard for some people to understand. It took me a while to understand this. But, but Allah, you know, before he created Adam, it seems to be what I've gathered is that there's, there was this kind of direct relationship with Allah. Like there's, you know, Tawheed, worshiping God alone. But that it seemed to be just you and God. So who existed before us? The creation of Adam would be the Shaytan. Okay, but at that time he was called, I believe, Azazil. And he was a jinn and he was allowed to worship with the Mada'ika. And they just kind of had this direct relationship with, with Allah. But at some point, Allah decided uh, to reveal. Of course, his, his decisions are eternal. They've always been. But, but to reveal to them that he's going to create this thing called a Khalifa. Now, what I want people to understand from this is that a Khalifa ends up being this sort of step now that you have to take, this means, this sebab that you have to go through now in order to worship Allah properly. Okay? Um, Meaning like you're worshiping Allah, but he's put now this sort of like means to get to him. That it's not just simply up to you to decide. You have to do things his way. And this gets back to what I call the Amr of Allah, his command. A lot of people misunderstand that Allah can command anything he wants. It doesn't have to make sense to you and me. He can command us, and a lot of Muslims are going to be shocked when I say this. He can command us to worship idols. And, and there would be, that would not be a violation of Tawheed because it's his command. Allah has commanded it. You have to go through these idols to get to me. Okay? For example, in the Quran, Allah says uh, he condemns shirk, and then he says that he, he never sent down any sultan for these things. Okay? There's no authority for you to do them. But it's almost as if some, what's implied in that sentence is that there could have been. Right? He's not like discounting that that's a reality, but it's not. I mean, he never instituted idolatry. But he could have. So the 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 concept of the concept of the Khalifa now becomes the new Amr. So what what's Shaitan's real problem here? Shaitan was a, a muwahid. He was someone who was worshiping Allah alone. But now all of a sudden Allah has put this this Khalifa, and the angels immediately understand what they're supposed to do: bow down to the Khalifa. But I mean, someone might say, like, well, is it bowing down an act of worship? Well, Allah can make anything he wants an act of worship. And he can also put any means to getting to him 
as a necessary part of your worship of him. Does that mean that the angels are worshiping Adam? Well, all Muslims would say the same thing, which is no, it doesn't. But they do have to bow down to Adam in order to be worshiping Allah properly. And that's the thing I want you to understand. This is uh, deals with uh, what, what I want to say is one of the key traits of all of these reform movements is, in Islam is to belittle the Prophet Muhammad uh, either by a attacking um, aspects of hadith, right, which is to say that you know as Muslims we can only follow the most sahih hadiths there are. Anything that has even the smallest amount of weakness or whatever, like it has to be completely discarded. Or taking it a step further than that, which is to attack hadith outright and say that this is uh, totally uh, something that we can't depend on. I, that's but a very good problem, point. Uh, this is the first time it clicked in my mind, what you just said. The idea that you can only follow authentic hadith is not in some ways very different from the people that completely reject hadith. Yes, yeah, the same. I hadn't, I hadn't made this distinction because you know, in our tradition, we accept even khabar wahid sometimes right. it has ijma on it. And so, because if if the prophet said it and it's khabar wahid, but then the companions of the prophet also agreed upon it, and the and the tabi'in agreed upon it, it becomes authentic to us that way. Right. And. Uh, so this is a very, very important point um, that I hadn't made that connection. But thank you. Yes, that's good. Alhamdulillah. Yes. And uh, that's why they don't have a problem bulldozing historical sites of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, Because all of these movements are exactly what Sheikh Imran calls them. They are soldiers of Dajjal. Mm. In order for these uh, Zionist Jews to complete their mission, which we, we know we've discussed this on your channel and you've discussed this numerous times. They have to, uh, they have to basically purge the Middle East of everything except for their Zionist Judaism, hmm. okay? Which is not authentic Judaism, by the way. <coughs> um, so that their Messiah, their Antichrist can come and rule. So, so, you know, they, they use these movements, whether the people that are involved in them know they're being used or not, I, I don't know. As I've discussed in the show I did with you and Sister Milan, you know, I believe that the real conspiracy is taking place in the spiritual world, okay? Whether or not human beings are communicating with each other in these, what appear to be uh, uh, con contemporaneous events, I, I, I can't prove that, but I can prove that the Shaytan is, is communicating with them. Mm. So I'll give you just an example of what I mean. Uh, so one of the ways that we get to the Prophet Muhammad is through the awliya. So there are there are such things as awliya. There are righteous people who've achieved a state of self-control and submission to Allah that allows them to have a, a more, more, you know, you could say closer relationship to Allah than the average person. And, and uh, these people are mentioned in the Quran, you know. Uh, I believe the ayah is in the awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim uh, wala hum yahzanun. You remember the ayah? <laughs> yeah. Ala awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wala hum yahzanun. Exactly. I forgot to quote the beginning. Ada. Indeed. So, so. And ala so can these, also mean beware, like a warning to certain people. Ala awliya yeah, Allah. It's also saying, let it be known. <laughs> yeah, let it be known that the awliya, the so, friends so, so, of Allah, are so those. So some of these movements. Uh, uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein correctly labeled a lot of these uh, extremist movements throughout the Middle East who would go and destroy the maqams of these uh, awliya. Uh, like if I remember correctly, in I believe Libya, the, the grave of Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, rahimahullah, uh, was demolished by one of them. Hmm. You know, and you can argue, well, well, okay, you know, whether you like it or not that a righteous person is buried next to a masjid or that they have a maqam and people visit it for tabarruq or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm not here to say what's right or wrong. What I am here to say, though, is that that holy person buried there is a means of you remembering the Prophet Muhammad Islam, because you're going to go there and see that person's grave. And of course, that person's grave is usually decorated with, you know, Muhammad Rasulullah and Ayatul Kursi and all kinds of other things. And you're going to understand that that was a person who dedicated their whole life to the way of Muhammad, the Muhammadan way. 
Now you bulldoze that over and you get rid of all that stuff and you just turn it into a regular old mound of dirt with maybe a, a name or something on it. This, the connection is not there. It's not the same. Uh, because you're putting that person on the same level as everybody else and they're not. They're not. It doesn't, it doesn't mean they're better than me or you because that's a law's decision to make. But as far as what we could tell from their life and their actions, they were definitely doing more than the average Muslim. But let's take it a step further. Bulldozing the houses and historical sites of companions of the Ahl al-Bayt, of just wiping everything out and, and under the auspices of just you know expanding this section of a building or, or putting up more hotels for people. But the point I'm trying to make is that's a means of disconnecting you from the Prophet. So, so what I mentioned first, attacking the hadith. The hadith is how we know the Prophet. You're not going to learn a whole lot about the Prophet Muhammad from reading the Quran. Right, it does mention things about him, but not to the to the degree that hadith do. It's it's simplified, right? I mean, in the Quran, it's 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 eloquent, and you need a certain imagination while reading Quran to capture something. Uh, but it's more practical; it's concrete, you know. Versus, well, you, you get to see. I mean, you're, you're, there's a narrative to his life, sallallahu that you get out of it that you don't get when you when you just throw the sira and hadith and everything out the window. I mean, you're you're, you're reading the Quran. And all of a sudden, Muhammad is this kind of abstract just name, right? It's just, it's just the praiseworthy one. You know, we don't really know who he was or what he did or, you know. So so th th these are the two two things I noticed about these movements is, is to tell. Well, let me explain to you why this works in the favor of the Antichrist, because I see too many of our friends and the people involved in Islamic eschatology falling for these traps. Mm. And, you know, the Antichrist you, you know, you students of Imran Hussein who are falling for this, and you students uh, and, and teachers who are falling for this, you know this. You know there's an Antichrist. Well, why? how is this working for the Antichrist? Well, because he wants to destroy Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa He so wants he to get him prophet. out of the picture. <clears throat> yeah. He wants to get all of the history of Islam from the time of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa onward, away. He wants the mosques gone. He wants the history gone. And he just wants the historical sites left that work for him and his cause. So he doesn't want to destroy Mecca. He wants to keep it because Abraham went there. And Moses told the children of Israel to keep it as a sign. Right? But he has no problem bulldozing all the maqams and bulldozing all the mosques and, and everything else. So what I'm trying to tell you is if you're one of these people who's in one of these movements or you're starting to believe in one of these movements or you're feeling attracted to one of these movements, you are falling right into the Antichrist's trap, which is that he's trying to use every means possible to bulldoze and destroy every aspect of Islam that relates to the Khalifa Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and he's doing exactly what the shaitan did when he refused, and I'm tying it back now to that story, when he refused to bow down to Adam. Once again, I'm going to emphasize the shaitan is not a mushrik uh, in the sense of he's an idol worshiper or something like that. The, the, the shaitan was worshiping Allah alone. He's a muwahid. But Allah gave an amr, and he disobeyed it. فَفَسَقَ عَنْ أَمْرِ Rabbi. So this... Uh, I actually heard this story. I wish I could find a verification of it, but uh, I think one of the oliya or one of the scholars of Islam, he asked to meet the shaitan. And he asked the shaitan, you know, like, why didn't you bow down to Adam when he asked? And he said, like, how can I bow down to, to something other than Allah? Right? So so this, uh, this is interesting because all of these reform movements, they're going to emphasize Tawheed for you. They're going to say, like, oh, you know, we're the ones that really worship God alone. Hmm. You know, uh, uh, when, when you go to these saints and you do this and when you call on the prophet Muhammad and in, in your prayers and you do that, you know, you're making sure when you pray towards Mecca, you're making sure when you do anything other than worship Allah directly, you're making sure this is the same argument the shaitan is making same argument because he doesn't like this idea of the Khalifa. And this gets back to the argument that, that Allah is making towards Bani Israel in the Quran, which is that I've given you now a new Khalifa and you don't like it. You don't like it. You didn't like your Messiah when I gave him to you. And now I'm giving you Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you don't like it. And so you're trying to go back to before the Amr came. Mm. And that's the same thing these reform movements are doing. They're following right in the footsteps. So partly of what you're saying is, partly what you're saying is that Shaitan in his experience 
had direct connection to Allah. There was no prophets for him. Right. And that was his downfall in a sense. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announced, I'm going to have a khalifa. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to, for, for example, Prophet Dawood, Ya Dawood, inna ja'alnaka khalifa tan fil ardi. Oh Dawood, we're going to make you a khalifa on earth. Meaning that the prophets of Allah, there's a, a narration in Sayyid Bukhari that also calls the prophets of Allah khalifas. Every time a, a khalifa passed, he was replaced by a, a khalifa of Allah, meaning a prophet of Allah. The sayasa, the, the politics of Bani Israel was done by the anbiya of Allah, the prophets of Allah. So every time a prophet passed, he was he was followed by another khalifa, another prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what shaitan is trying to do is to take us back to his mode, where it's just him and Allah for us as he had it. That led him astray. And he wants to remove the prophets of Allah or the khalifa of Allah, meaning khalifa of Allah can mean the prophets of Allah, can also mean the awliya Allah. Or it could also mean the pious caliphs. Because, you know, the movement you mentioned from Najd it, it also discounts the ijma of the sahaba via the khilafah in many instances. So am I understanding this, what you're trying to say? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say that, that, that what, what they're trying to do is, is, is atomize you. Okay, because one of the things that happens when we, we, we take on the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is we become this kind of body that's all operating uh, in the same way, right? I mean, you're still an individual, but you're praying towards Mecca. You, you have your five days salat at certain times. Uh, and there's so many things I could mention. But the point is that you're, you, you take on the spirit of the Prophet Muhammad in, 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 in your essence. You're sub the more you submit to that is actually your proximity to Allah's presence, you could say. So by destroying the Prophet Muhammad, either by, by discounting his hadith or destroying his memory by physically removing all the things that would, would help us have, uh, br bring that to life for us when we visit these places, or disconnecting us from the awliya, or disconnecting us from the sahaba, or disconnecting us from any of this, uh, by destroying that, it, it now puts you in the seat. And if you'll notice, even with some of these movements, the eventual conclusion of them is that Muhammad is irrelevant. He's simply a mailman. He drops off to you the Quran, and now it's your job as an individual to become the sole interpreter of what that means. And this is across the board. I mean, these movements exist in all religions. The, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in his prophecies about the Dajjal entering into, uh, entering into religions. So he entered into Christianity, Okay, and it eventually formed Protestantism. What is Protestantism other than the atomization of Christianity? Yeah. Where every single person is now the sole interpreter of the Bible, solo scriptura, right? Bible only, you could call it. Right? So, just so, my, it just so my audience can understand what Imam Isa is saying. So, you know, they, they had the Pope and those people under the Pope, they were helping the people in a uniform way, in a in whatever capacity, a traditional way to interpret the Bible. The West has a reaction to that and says, no, we don't want the Pope. We don't want the church. We don't want all that. We're going to interpret the Bible for ourselves. And so they dismiss that. This is what is happening with Islam today, is that we want to dismiss our entire tradition and think that, I don't know how people... Help me understand this, is that how can you be authentic if you're not connected to the original source? Like, I, I, I guess that's not a question in their mind. Like, you have to be, in order to be the same as the original, you can't just guess it, right? You have to be, the only way to know that you're connected to something that is authentically from the past, you have to be connected to the past, Otherwise, you're just going to guess, okay, I guess Islam is like this. And it doesn't matter what it was in the past. I don't understand, I guess, how these people are thinking in terms of authenticity. Well, I'll tell you exactly what's happening. Their ego is becoming their God. 
so 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 the ego becomes the uh, sole interpreter of scripture, and whatever conclusions it comes it comes to are the right conclusions, right? And that's why some of them become so extreme, and they have to anathematize everyone else from the ummah. So mm -hmm. if you pray towards Mecca, you're a mushrik. If you pray at the Western Wall, you're a mushrik. If you, you know, there's just an endless number of, of uh, ways that they kick you out of the deen, mm -hmm. right? But I I'll say to them that, that you turn your own book into a god also, and particularly your understanding of it. That becomes your, the, the idol. And as I was taught by my teachers is that your ego and the shaitan are best friends, except the ego won't ever tell you that the shaitan is the one directing him. And, and part of submitting to the Prophet is, is that you obliterate your ego and you take on his essence, you know. And, and, and this, by the way, this concept is in Christianity. It's, you know, uh, the, the idea of, of taking on the kind of uh, uh, becoming like Jesus, you know what I mean? So, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. So, uh, now, how does this relate to the occult? And, and I want you all to, to take some time and go ponder over this, uh, which is to look up Phoenix, okay? Look up the Phoenix. The Phoenix is the mythical creature that arises out of the ashes of civilization. <laughs> now, now uh, uh, Hamza Yusuf mentions in a very good video on YouTube, uh, I'd share it with you, but the screen sharing is a little bit problematic uh, today. Uh, but he mentions this hadith from the Prophet Islam where he mentions that... Um, that civilization will become, uh, will be destroyed and destruction will become civilization, okay? Now this, this hadith blew my mind when I heard it because it helped me understand what modern civilization is doing, mm -hmm. not just intellectually, but physically all over the world, is they invade all traditional religions, they invade all traditional societies, they, they destroy them, and then they replace them with modern Western civilization, which is a destructive civilization. Okay, so if you think about what, what is modern Western civilization except something that is that consumes, uh, like my, my country, the United States, we have 5% of the world's population, but we consume 30% of its resources. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, extremely problematic. If, if everyone in the world lived like Americans live, then we'd be, we'd have destroyed the earth, you know, a couple times over now. Hmm. by consuming everything that it has and it's just like th this is the civilization of gog and magog you know they drink all the water it's oh, gone yeah. it's destroyed so so exactly what the prophet said is ha said is now happening right in front of us and that's what all these movements are whether it's postmodernism or feminism or these uh these scripture only movements or whatever they're trying to attack the foundations of everything to, to just crush down to the ground absolutely everything that, that's been built up and it's holding people together. And then mm. it atomizes everybody and turns you, us all into the sole uh, means by which we, we, we get everything done. So, so you become the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu essentially. It would be like where they would take you to. You're the one that allowed to open up the Quran and read it for yourself or the Bible would read it for yourself and, and interpret it for, for what you think it means. And, and, and a lot of them, they'll use a really interesting trick, which is they'll say, well, look at the condition of the Muslims today. Hmm. They'll say like, oh, you know, our, our situation is so bad. And, and, and see, it's because we pray towards the Kaaba, or it's because we believe in weak hadith, or it's because we go to the maqams of saints and we, we make dua to Allah there because it's a place of tabaruk. You know, they bring all of these arguments and then they work off this, the emotions of, of Muslims by saying, yes, we are humiliated. But they totally forget that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned so many reasons why you'd be humiliated that have nothing to do with that. You know, like, for example, uh, and I'll just read this. This has always been very interesting to me, which is, uh, he said, Wasallam, that if you deal in riba, so blending and borrowing money on interest, and you hang on to the tales of cattle being satisfied with agricultural life hmm. and cultivation. And you cease to, to defend yourselves for the sake of Allah. Then Allah will inflict humiliation upon you and he will not remove it until you return to your religion. So, so the Prophet is saying that, you know, there's reasons 
that are associated with the Muslim condition of today that are, have nothing to do with what these reform movements are, are saying. They have everything to do with the fact that Muslims have entered into an entire economic system that's oppressive and sinful and, 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 and basically makes us all debt slaves. That we do not defend ourselves from our enemies. We don't even know who our enemies are most of the time. We're, we're, we're literally, as you pointed out on your show many times, we're holding hands with our enemies and marching down the street with them. Our scholars are doing it. Mm. And, and a lot of us are very satisfied with a kind of dunya we life, you know, whether it's just like uh, I, I have my, you know, my farm and my, my off the grid, uh, you know, uh, permaculture or whatever. And I'm just I'm just satisfied over here by myself. But that's not what our religion was sent to do. It was sent to do Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi and al-Munkar. It was, it was sent to set up a, a, a khilafah. It was sent to do so many things. It was sent to have a Jumu'ah, a community. You know, so so this concept of jama'ah and bay'ah and khalifa, and these are all being attacked mm. because it atomizes people. It makes you incredibly weak. It, de it detaches you from the very thing that's going to get you to the presence of Allah, which is the Prophet Islam and his companions and the awliya and all these things. And so it, it, it basically puts us all in the worst possible position we could be in. And as it's been pointed out by many good Muslim YouTubers, and this is what I'm going to conclude with, and I don't want to make this too long today because I've gone on really long, is that with all of these movements, it doesn't matter what they are and how nice they sound to my ears. I always ask myself one question, and you better ask yourself the same question, which is how does this benefit modern Western civilization? Hmm. If Orthodox Sunni Islam is so bad and so wrong, what are you offering me and how well does that congeal with modern Western civilization? Because if Khilafah is terrible and Bayah is terrible and the Awliya are terrible and praying towards Mecca is terrible and praying five times a day is terrible, then what are you offering me? And then how nice does that look to the Rand Corporation? <laughs> how nice does that look to the American government? How nice does that look to Israel? It looks real nice most of the time. And that's why I know something is very wrong with what you're calling me to. Because I know what's right. Mm. What's right cannot possibly be Gog and Magog's world, the Antichrist's world. That is definitely wrong. And sometimes you have to know what's wrong in order to understand what's right. And I see it today that there's only two things that are standing up to the complete takeover, one world order, Gog and Magog order. And that is Orthodox Islam and Orthodox Christianity. And they're both pretty weak at this point. And mm. I can tell you from personally seeing them both myself, uh, we're very weak, very, very weak. And all of these moves, I don't care who you are and what you call yourselves and what your name is or what you think is so special about your sect that you think is the truth. You're all soldiers of the Dajjal if you're ta attacking this institution that's the only thing left standing. Once Orthodox Islam collapses and Orthodox Christianity collapses, then that system will take over the entire world without anything to stop it. And that's when Dajjal can just march in, sit on his throne, and start ruling the world. Because he has nothing else to stand up against. The two world religions that believe Jesus is the Messiah have completely collapsed in on themselves. Mm. They're busy fighting with each other over nonsense issues, and he can just bulldoze down everything. So that's all I wanted to say about this particular issue today. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to add one thing since you mentioned Rand Corporation and uh, have your comments on that, inshallah, and then we can inshallah end and inshallah continue at another time. Um, so let me share with you. And by the way, that's that's the phoenix rising out of the ashes. You know, that, that is the phoenix, phoenix, right? Yes, yes. The phoenix is the fire that's going to destroy everything. And then the new world <coughs> order arises out of the ashes of it. So in 2003, Rand Corporation, which is a think tank, came out with a paper on what to do with Muslims because they saw Muslims in a flux. I mean, they literally even say this, that, you know, Islam is in a, a state of flux and we have to determine uh, for Islam uh, what, sh uh, what should be the outcome. So the first paragraph, there's no question that contemporary Islam is in a volatile state, engaged in internal and external struggle over its own values, its identity, its place in world. 
rival versions are contending for spiritual and political dominance. This conflict has serious costs and economic, social, political, and security implications for the rest of the world. Consequently, the West is making an increased effort. The West is making an increased effort to come to terms to understand and to influence the outcome of this struggle. Now, in 2003, what they said basically is uh, who should we support? Okay. So support the modernists, right? Support uh, the, uh, the traditionalists that would work against Khilafah, uh, tr support the secularists, right? Selectively support secularists. Now, what has happened as a result? Now, if you look at that report 2003, and here we are, uh, you know, close to 2023, 20, 20 years almost. So what is the result? The result is all the traditional movements that were standing up for Khilafah, for the establishment of an Islamic environment, they that's not even a discussion hardly anymore. Or even if it is, it's not within the traditional realm. And now the modernists, so, so they were still, now the modernists are being used, according to this, would be used against the traditionalists. And what does that mean? That means that anyone who's going against tradition is following the, uh, the pathway set out by these think tanks, in a sense, which is, as you said, the Jalik. And it's, it's the Islam that the West is happy with. And that's basically what you're doing. You're, you're creating an Islam that the West will be happy with and willing to shake hands with and say, okay, so now you can have a seat at the table. Um, I guess the problem there then becomes is that some people just don't see the problem of this civilization because they're, you know, from one perspective, it's, you know, it's Zina. It's beautiful. It's glittery. It's dazzling. There's no, nothing been so great as what we have right now. We don't even... In some ways, if they're honest to themselves, if you think of this as good, then we don't even need Islam because it's it's like taking humanity to a peak that Islam couldn't from their perspective. And uh, this is what modernity is about. Modernity is all about being uh, denying the past, denying. I mean, that's you're not truly modern until you say, I don't believe in the what we have now is better than necessarily what we had before until until you curse the people that came before you yeah, that's right and so um yeah if you could speak to the rand report maybe just in uh, a little bit and then we can inshallah call it a day and then try to see when we can have another session well i mean you know the rand report is like jack parsons and alistair crowley and so many pieces <laughs> of the puzzle when you go read about these things they're going to help connect dots for you and you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about today on the show. It's just a piece of glaringly obvious evidence right in front of your face that if you're part of one of these sectarian movements in Islam, whatever you are, that attacks traditional Islam and says that everything we're doing is wrong and we're making sure when it's you know, things that all Muslims accept and have accepted for thousands of years, over a thousand years, then you're, 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 you're a, a a tool, a puppet, a pawn of, of the very uh, thing that the Rand Corporation is talking about. Hmm. You know, they're part of the Phoenix. They're trying to demolish traditional Islam, traditional religion all over the world. Um, I want to try just at the end here, and this is a great way to cap off our conversation, which is to play our teacher, Sheikh Imran, actually describing this. Um, but I'm trying to see if I can actually get it to play. Uh, but it's very, very uh, a uh, short video on his channel. Um... Britain is now an atheist country. Nobody goes to church anymore. That's why they have to sell all their churches and cathedrals and so on. They can't afford to maintain them. Nobody going to church. They're becoming an atheist state. The modern West wages war not only on Islam, but on the religious way of life. And the objective of this war is to transform all of mankind into one global godless society. <coughs> Western civil
that's what I'm saying. Mm. You know, you're you're if you're infected by these movements, then you're part of the demolition process. And you know, Lisa, really even though sense. even though this is kind of out of the topic, but I think it's a good place to bring this in and and then I'll let you go after after you comment on what I'm going to comment on. That you know, there's an ayah of the Quran. Do you believe in part of the book? And you reject the other part of the book. This Islam, traditional Islam, has been attacked so much, as every religion has. That it, it you know, uh, but that Islam, Islam started as something strange and will return back to something strange. That it cannot recognize itself, so to say, right? So Islam has been so degraded that it's not much different degraded in some senses than other religions that have been degraded. Meaning uh, Judaism has been changed. Christianity has been changed. Other religions have been changed. They don't, they're not there. They don't, they're not in their original. They're not in their original state. And that's what happened with Islam. And because, so, you know, a lot of people ask like, you know, why would Quran, uh, you know, sympathize with traditional Christianity, I think one of the reasons is, is that in this fall of religions, right, even though Islam theoretically still has that tradition that we can hold on to, but in the practical world, in the practical world, Islam has fallen so bad that in some senses it's even worse than Christianity. I mean, Comparing it to people that follow Christianity, meaning Muslims are holding on to dunya more than even Christians. And it's fallen so badly, it's degraded itself so badly, that even though it's the true religion, it is the only true religion, but it's been degraded and diluted, maybe is another word, so much that there are parts of Christianity that are actually better even in practice today, than the degraded version that Muslims as a whole are following. So they actually can become, in a sense, a support line. Imam Razi, when I was reading his tafsir on this ayah of the Quran, where it says, you will find the Christians closest to you, he mentions uh, that when you look at the Quran, you find the Christians are more... Uh, open to the hereafter. Like they have the Rahban, they have the monks, right? They love Jesus in much the same way a traditional Muslim would love the Prophet ﷺ, meaning they have a very strong affinity to the person of Jesus ﷺ. And so there are parts of traditional Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, that even though it's also fallen the same way Islam has fallen, and even though Islam is the truth, I mean, I want that to be clear. I don't want somebody to n misunderstand what I'm saying. But because all religions have fallen, and it's this it's the Islam today we have we have today is not the Islam of Muhammad. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say, right? It's like a very even our wudu water is is this water that's not from the original sources. Our zakat is not with gold and silver. I mean, just the whole edifice is is collapsed without realizing it. Riba is everywhere. Uh, we don't have an Islamic political economic system. I mean, just the, everything from that level to our water has been compromised. So what's left of Islam? And we're so happy with this pro progress and technology and all of this that we don't even think for a second that is this where Islam wanted humanity to go, right? We're just like going with the flow. The people that have actually resisted technology the most are the Christians, for example. Like you have the the uh, the the Amish, for example, and so on. They've been they are the ones that have been questioning. Wait, is this the way we want to go? So what I'm trying to say is that everything is so diluted that. Even other religions that got dilute, diluted, but at this point, there are parts, large parts of the Muslim world that are even more diluted than them. And that's why whatever truth remains in Islam, in that diluted form, and whatever truth remains in other, Christ, in other religions, specifically Christianity, in that diluted form, 
they are the only vanguards against this postmodern onslaught that intends to do away with religion completely and specifically with the institution of prophethood sallallahu and then with that the hereafter really just goes into the background and uh, yeah so please comment on that uh, what i was trying to say maybe you have something to say about that too yeah i, I thought of actually a lot of things while, while you were saying that um, i don't know if i'll remember all of them all together but it, it, you i mean you're basically describing the same sentiments I've come to. Uh, first, I will say that there are still pockets of traditional religion being lived out, still left on the earth, uh, both in Christianity and Islam, and even Judaism. Um, but there's like, uh, as Christians would call them, there's just a remnant of this left. <laughs> it's just mm. a little remnant of believers here and there in small <clears throat> pockets. The the big body of everything, has, everything has been uh, redefined Right. Well, you harifun al kalima and mawadi. So zakat used to be gold and silver. Now it's paper money. Uh, there used to be the khalifa. Now it's uh, you know uh, the you know, and, 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 and democracy and, and everything else. <coughs> all, all of the things have been. All the words are still there. The meanings have all changed. Yeah. Uh, there used to be something called marriage, you know, and now it, it's whatever, you know. Um, there used to be a thing called a man and a woman, but now that doesn't exist anymore. You know. Yes. It, it's and and you know, marriage has two components: so the companionship component and the hierarchy component, right? So they kept the within as individualism went up, the companionship went up, and the hierarchy went down. Right. So well, they have they have, they have to destroy all hierarchies, all yeah. of them. They completely level the playing field. And so what they're trying to do with Islam is what has already happened with Christianity. They destroyed Catholicism and they created a new Christianity on Protestant thought. Uh, and I guess, you know, they want to do the same thing. They want, and they are doing it. I mean, they have already done it, except for some small pockets, fringe, crazy people like me and you, right? Uh, that are still holding on to the tradition. And at the same time, there are many people that are holding on to tradition compared to even the people that understand what's happening. Meaning there, there are people Allah gave them the tawfiq to hand to to hold on to the tradition. And they, for first for whatever Allah's mercy, they haven't been affected uh by this onslaught of the West. And then there are those of us that come from the West, I guess. Or, or aware of the West and or we were part of that onslaught. We felt we got a certain piece of that, but then we chose by Allah's grace to be with traditional Islam. Um, yeah. Well, and, in a lot of ways, you know, and this maybe will appeal, appeal to the people who are into the entertainment. So there was a movie that came out in 1999 called The Matrix. And, you know, the premise of The Matrix, it, it, Matrix is that, you know, uh, human beings have been enslaved by technology and they are stuck in this kind of fantasy world attached to machines and then the machines are just using human beings as a battery and the uh but there's these people who've kind of gotten out of it somehow and they're they 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 go back into the 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 illusion that the machines have created in order to try to free people one by one hmm. interesting and get them out of it and and that's effectively like people like me and you you know we we were, we were both connected to the modern Western civilization and its, you know, grid system of, of slavery. <laughs> but then we've tried to gradually unplug ourselves from it, right? And, uh, and, 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 you know, that's effectively what the original Muslim community was doing. You know, I mean, they, they, were, they were stuck into the <coughs> matrix of idolatry and riba and everything else. And the Prophet Islam comes along, he's kind of like the, the, um, the figure that, you know, tries to tell them the truth and get them to come out of that. And then that movement forms its own system that now becomes a challenge. And if you're an atomized sectarian person uh, who doesn't have anywhere to go and meet or any ritual to go do or anything like that, you're, you're not going to stand a chance against this system. So even though you think you're right and you have the truth and everything, 
because you've disconnected yourself now from traditional Islam, which is still some sort of body, although maybe one on life support, um, you you are incredibly weak, incredibly, incredibly weak. Um, yeah, and your ideas but, will die with you, even though they'll right. perpetuate in terms of uh, in terms of maybe the general idea. But your specific ideas are just going to be a fantasy land for you and then you're going to die with it. The other thing I wanted to emphasize is that all one of the well, OK, we'll just leave it till here for now. Inshallah. Khair, inshallah. Thank you for um, sharing your thoughts. And uh, I hope, inshallah, Allah opens the hearts of the people and myself for what you said and uh, take it very seriously because this is really, the judge absolutely has to do this. He has to, in order to be say I'm a prophet, he has to belittle the prophet. He has to go to opposite of وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ He has to belittle the prophet enough so that when he says he's a prophet and he shows his miracles and when we're des in a desperate situation for food or whatever it is we'll be able to justify it to ourselves at that time that yeah maybe he is a prophet you know and 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 so um the jazz onslaught is definitely on the institution of prophethood there's absolutely no doubt about it yeah he has to he has to specifically belittle jesus christ who is the Messiah, and Prophet Muhammad, who said Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Because that, that, that idea is incredibly dangerous. Hmm. You know, the Quran is dangerous. The Gospels are dangerous because they will, they're the pieces of evidence that, that the Antichrist is a liar, that he's not who he says he is. Hmm. And the belief in those books, which is a requirement for all Muslims, and at least uh, the Quran talks about Christians who will eventually accept that the Quran is truth. They'll remain Christians, but they'll accept that the Quran is true. Um, th these people, they, they're they very dangerous to Dajjal. So whatever way he can, he has to belittle, like you said, the institution of prophethood. He has to redefine words. He has to demolish the foundations of all of the religion of Islam and of Christianity, specifically these two. And, and then I'll say this is kind of maybe a final point to, to Muslims and Christians who are watching this is that he has to make us fight each other because mm. nothing works more in his favor than for the two people who actually know that Jesus, peace be upon him, is the Messiah to just wipe our, each other out. It's easier for him to kind of march in and take over. Mm. And it makes us look bad when we fight each other. Right. You know, it, it turns people away from the truth. Okay, thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.